Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Um, I would uh, like to uh, first um, uh, introduce the uh, AUC Gerhardt Center uh, webinar series. This is the uh, a specialized webinar series on the new social impact ecosystem um, that's after the COVID-19. Um, we have a distinguished uh, guest speaker, Professor Stuart Hart. Uh, the topic is on the uh, new age of sustainable capitalism. Um, Stuart Hart is the uh, founder of the uh, uh, base of the Pyramid BOP Global Network. Um, and um, according to Bloomberg Business Week, he is the, uh, one of the founding fathers of the uh, BOP economic theory and methodology. Uh, and we have we have we have him here uh, with us in uh, on Gerhard Center webinar series. Um, Stu is also one of the world's top authorities on the implications of the environment and poverty on, on uh, for business strategy. He is professor and uh, Stephen Grossman distinguished fellow uh, in sustainable business at the University of Vermont uh, and uh, co-founder of the uh, Vermont Grossman School of Business Sustainable Innovation MBA uh, program. Uh, so the topic is going to be on sustainable capitalism. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can ask uh, Kariman on the host. You can just uh, type in your questions in the chat box. You don't need to raise your hand. Just uh, write in the questions to Kariman on the uh, on the uh, chat box or uh, um, uh, in the uh, Zoom chat box. And uh, basically, the topic is on uh, sustainable capitalism. And I'm uh, and uh, I'm sure that we all are thinking about, you know, what's going to happen after COVID-19? How is the world economy going to be? Uh, what's the new normal? Uh, what's the uh, how can uh, you know the uh, uh, capital uh, be uh, capitalism be uh, observed and implemented in different uh, different environments? So. Uh, um, um, from a uh, social impact perspective, let me uh, uh, go ahead and uh, uh, let Stuart uh, start our uh, the talk. Stuart, you are muted. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Now. Yeah. Okay, now. Good. Good. Yeah. So, uh, Tarek, thanks so much for that introduction, and uh, Ali and Karaman, a pleasure to be with you guys and. Uh, and be involved in the webinar. So thanks for inviting me. Um, I'd like to, if I could, you know, the broadly around this theme of a new age, a new age of sustainable capitalism with a question mark. Uh, just as Tariq was saying, uh, you know, the, the question is, is this a breakthrough or a breakdown? <laughs> you know, what, what, what we're going through. So so I'll invoke a theory from evolutionary bio biology that's been more and more applied to social evolution called pu punctuated equilibrium, which some of you may be familiar with, right? The idea that uh, sort of the opposite of gradualism, that change typically happens in fits and starts, right? that there are uh, signal moments, you know, inflection points, and then period, relative periods of stability, right? And, and, the, and I think the question that we're probably all asking ourselves is, does the current COVID-19 crisis represent such a punctuation point that ushers in what we could think of as a new age of actually socially inclusive and environmentally sustainable capitalism? And I, you know, so if, that, if that's our broad question, sometimes it's useful to kind of look back in time uh, and to realize that this isn't the first time that, you know, that capitalism has undergone you know, transformation. In fact, there have been many twists and turns in the road, uh, you know, sort of the evolution of capitalism over the last three or four hundred years, but but the most recent one, I would say, goes back to the 70s. You know, the last really big disruption goes back to the 1970s, which was, of course, the age of the OPEC oil embargo, right, which had a major impact on the world, and you know, in the U.S., but I think globally as well, but especially the U.S. produced a what's called the lost decade. You know, kind of a uh, a, a flat or down stock market, stagflation, you know, just a, just a horrendous, you know, kind of set of financial performance indicators over the course of the entire decade. And this then opened the door and ushered in, it was the crisis that opened the door to our current model of capitalism, you know, that we'll, that we'll call shareholder primacy or uh, market fundamentalism or, or neoliberalism. And Milton Friedman, you know, sort of ever observant, 
uh, a wonderful quote from him, and you know, from just about that period, where he observes, you know, only a crisis, actual or perceived, produces change. When that crisis occurs, the actions taken depend on the ideas that are laying around. You know? In other words, often what gets invoked, what gets put into play, are ideas that have been sort of hovering there in the perhaps even in the background for some period of time. And that was certainly the case when it came to uh, shareholder primacy and what we'll call market fundamentalism. You know, certainly his signal paper in 1970, The Social Responsibility of Businesses to Increase Profits, was an important contributor to that. But the reality is that the thinking around uh, market fundamentalism and shareholder primacy goes back far further, right? And in fact, the Mont Pelerin Society was founded in the wake of the Second World War, first meeting 1947 that Friedman attended, but it was founded by Friedrich Hayek and uh, Ludwig von Mises, you know, two, two famous libertarians. Uh, and they had been developing this thinking for the better part of 25 years uh, when the oil crisis occurred, right? So in other words, there were lots of ideas laying around at that point in time. Uh, the Lewis Powell memo is famous in the US, you know, as sort of a Supreme Court justice who observes how important it is to re reformulate kind of the relationship of business to society. Uh, you know, kind of thinking around public choice theory with James Buchanan. Uh, then the Koch brothers and a bunch of think tanks like the Cato Institute, the election of Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher ushered in this age, right, which really kind of came home to roost in a serious way during the 1980s. You know, the idea of a quasi-religious belief in markets and an utter disdain for government, right? I mean, I, and, I, and I think that's, uh, especially in the U.S., but I think around the world, that, that sort of colored our thinking about capitalism and business over the last 30 plus years. And the way that, the form that that took, the way that took shape when it comes to business, you know, in, the, in kind of the age of shareholder primacy and financial capitalism is, you know, efficient markets hypotheses from, uh, from, uh, from FAMA, which, you know, in, increasingly under fire, but carried a lot of weight, right, in, in the idea that that stock price is the best in single indicator of the performance of a company overall, because stock price incorporates all information. Uh, that agency theory is important because you realize that uh, those managing companies that don't own the company may not have uh, the right incentives. So let's tie comp executive compensation to stock price uh, in the form of options. And, you know, the uh, kind of the law and economics movement, you know, kind of realizing that the best way to discipline all this is through, you know, kind of raiders and activist investors brought about kind of the, the world that we now live in, you know, the kind of the greed is good world where uh, stock price is the driver. Uh, and the best way to measure that is through quarterly returns, which sort of drives short termism, right? That, that, that's been kind of the world we've been in for the last 30 plus years. Uh, it took over business schools at that point in time in the 1980s. I still, especially now kind of reflecting back on it, that's when I 1985 was the year I became an assistant professor at the University of Michigan in the business school. So, you know, thinking back on that, I can actually rather vividly remember the process of takeover of the business school happening by those that brought this perspective in. Uh, there were lots of older faculty that were uh, encouraged to retire at that point in time. And, you know, kind of the world of business education was fundamentally different by the time the 90s rolled around compared to the early 80s. And, you know, in the wake of that, you know, for the last 30 plus years, um, yeah, you know, like tremendous wealth has been created, especially for the wealthy. Uh, but also, you know, 2 billion people have been lifted out of poverty, especially in China, but other parts of the world too. So it's been great for the investor class. And, and, and in terms of, of, of poverty alleviation, you know, has been quite effective in some parts of the world, especially Asia but has also wreaked havoc on climate. You know, we've, we've lost, uh, by all estimates, half of the world's species over the last 30, 40 years. And inequality has risen to the point, you know, that it, where it hasn't been since the late 1920s. Uh, so from a societal perspective, you know, it's, it's pretty clear that 
this idea of market fundamentalism and shareholder primacy has hasn't necessarily delivered right on, on all of society's goals. So unsurprisingly, for the last 30 years or so, right, there's been some pushback, right? You see kind of countervailing forces that have emerged, and I'll just put up here some of the buzzwords, I think, you know, that and and you know, sort of like a tribalism that's occurred over the last 30 years in terms of 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 approaches, methodologies, in some cases movements, uh, and you can just see a few of them here, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, mutual value or shared value or blended value or sustainable value or social innovation or social entrepreneurship or, I mean, what, what all of these have in common is a realization, right, that the kind of the, the unfettered market, you know, kind of dri driven by stock price isn't really delivering, you know, <laughs> not delivering the entire loaf. It's only delivering a partial loaf. And, you know, and, and, and I personally have been, you know, quite involved in a number of these over the last 30 years, trying to bring a different way of thinking, a different perspective into the business world and into business education. That's sort of been my, my life's work. And, you know, I think now, now we're faced with the question of, can we bring these various kind of tribal movements, methods, and approaches together? Can these be coalesced into something more than just a set of disparate kind of uh, initiatives undertaken by you know by by a, by a bunch of entrepreneurial faculty members and consultants because you know, that because that's really sort of what it's been over the last thirty years and you know we we may see some signal some sign you know even ahead of COVID that that might be happening you know we have the likes of Larry Fink and BlackRock you know that have now you know now kind of come out strongly around the idea that we should transition from a stockholder driven model of management to a stakeholder driven model that purpose should really become you know the kind of the key driver you know and Fink of course has written now several last three years or so you know his annual letter to CEOs I think has been quite important and that has been uh, you know now folded into the business roundtable's new change of, of perspective right on uh, uh, on the you know America's CEO that it should be all about corporate purpose and so forth, which is a signal change in many ways because the business roundtable since the 90s has preached shareholder primacy. Right, so m many would say that you know that those changes, you know that you know Larry Fink being you know kind of the head of the world's largest asset manager uh, certainly has an important say and is influential as is the business roundtable. But many would say that these are largely symbolic statements right that you you know let's judge the companies based on their actions rather than kind of symbolic statements but nonetheless i think you know the, the these sort of signal that change was in the winds uh co covid may now have a bigger driving effect but i think all of this you know kind of all of these changes including the most these most recent kind of signals from larry fink and from the business roundtable then raises the question you know is is the solution just to abolish, you know, the idea of shareholder value altogether? Because there are certainly those that push for that, right? That, that <laughs> there are those that believe just the idea of stock price in the stock market. It, 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 we should just simply abolish that as, you know, any sort of signal of what, you know, what the private sector is all about. That, you know, get investors off the backs of corporations. You know, we should require if, if we're going to, you know, if, we're, if it's still going to be there, let's make sure there are longer holding periods. Uh, let's require public companies to serve all their stakeholders and so forth. You know, you see a lot of a lot of kind of rearguard movements, you know, that that take these kinds of positions. And so then I think we can ask the question, is this is it really that simple? Right. Just just sort of get getting getting investors off the backs of companies. Is that going to solve the problem? And, you know, because we there, there's certainly evidence that missing earnings targets is actually an indicator of bad demand bad management, not, not necessarily, you know, uh, a bias against long term, you know, there's, there's quite a bit of empirical evidence to show that that's the case when firms miss targets, they tend to perform worse in the long term as well. Uh, and that some investors are perfectly willing, right, to sit and wait, you know, <laughs> like Amazon took four, 14 years, you know, before it became profitable. And, and then we have a, a large number of ventures like like Uber and WeWork and Spotify and a number of others that uh, went public, right, you know, with great fanfare, 
you know, IPOs that just were absolutely absolute killers. But then, of course, the stock prices crash. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. But still, I think this sort of gives some pause to the idea that that kind of getting after and addressing the problems of market fundamentalism, shareholder primacy, are, is just a matter of, of uh, you know, kind of no longer paying su such close attention to the idea of shareholder value. I personally don't think that's the case, right? I actually think that what we're in now and what COVID represents is, it will represent, it already does represent, a fundamental reassertion of government. And, uh, you know, uh, so the positive view is we come out of this with, especially in a place like the United States, a rejuvenated sense of the importance of functioning and competent government. Uh, there'll be more and more societal pressure because COVID has, has laid bare the inequalities, you know, even more so than we knew before. So there'll be more and more public pressure and public policy pressure to, to round out and change and widen you know, what the function of business is in the world. So I think it takes us back to, uh, you know, kind of like back to the future, you know, that, <laughs> that the idea that shareholder value is just about quarterly earnings is a, is a relative, relatively recent, you know, uh, f figment of our, our uh, sort of methodological imagination driven by those theories that I mentioned earlier. You know, if you really think back further, the idea of shareholder value, especially long-term shareholder value, uh, requires, you know, a much more sort of uh, multivariate, you know, and, uh, and, and very diverse set of kind of, of uh, criteria and goals. So, you know, I've done some work around this over the last 20 years that, and this is just kind of an oversimplified version of the balanced scorecard, that long-term shareholder value really requires, you know, uh, entrepreneurs and business people not to just think about today's business. It also requires simultaneously that they be building tomorrow's opportunity. And it's not, you know, first we manage today's business, then we worry about tomorrow, which you have to do both at the same time, you know, and do both well. And those are, those are in some ways paradoxical and competing logics. And similarly, you know, any business to drive long-term value creation has to be focused on nurturing kind of skills, capabilities, competencies in order to deliver right on today's business, but at the same time has to be engaged with external constituencies in order to pick up weak signals and understand you know how change, adaptation, and innovation should be driven. And these two are kind of are competing and somewhat paradoxical uh, priorities and capabilities but that companies that are going to be managed for long-term value have to do both well all the time, right? And so that means it's necessary to reduce costs, reduce risk, you know, kind of focus on short-term profitability for sure in today's business by execution, right, around in, by nurturing capabilities that already exist in the company. But you also had better be concerned about, you know, reputation, legitimacy, differentiation out there in the world, you know, because you, if you're, if you're totally internally focused, you can be super efficient and effective at delivering on the capabilities you have, but they may run into a stone wall out in the world and be rejected. Right? And we've certainly seen plenty of, of examples of that over the last 20 years ago with the Enrons and WorldComs and so forth. Right? That, that, that can be fatal. But just, you know, kind of focused on the internal capabilities and external constituencies in today's business isn't enough either. And I think what the COVID crisis and the resistance to market fundamentalism over the last 30 years has shown is the importance of the upper part of this two by two, that we have to focus much more on building tomorrow's opportunity and prioritize that. What are the new skills, new technologies, new capabilities that are going to be required to get to an effective, more inclusive and environmentally sustainable future? How do we reposition the company over time and not just think about delivering on current competencies. If all you do is nurture and perfect the current competencies you have, eventually you fly that plane into the ground, right? So you have to be very focused on building new skills, capabilities, and competencies. And similarly, you have to be thinking about where are tomorrow's markets, right? What's the growth path and trajectory for the firm? Uh, it, it isn't just a matter of better serving and building reputation and legitimacy around today's business. It's also about finding tomorrow's markets and creating them. And so that's where, you know, this idea of the sustainable value model, sustainable value framework, which, you know, I've been working on for over 20 years, 
now I think really takes on uh, truly added significance. Because I think in the coming years, in the wake of COVID, it's going to be all about redefining what value really means. Uh, and it's going to be much more societally driven. That, you know, when it comes to this lower left quadrant in terms of reducing cost and risk, then, you know, the, the sustainability drivers of that have to do with, and strategies have to do with minimizing waste and emissions from operations. You know, this is about continuous improvement and eco efficiency. This has been around for a long time, you know, already uh, 20, 25 years, you know, companies have been after this. Uh, it, it won't, uh, this won't lessen, but I think we've already got a pretty good grip on this. What will accelerate, you know, is this lower right quadrant, you know, having to do with product stewardship where we're not just focused on current business facilities with pollution prevention and minimizing the waste from them. Rather, we're thinking about the entire life cycle of product systems. We're thinking about the sustainability and inclusiveness of our supply chains. We're thinking about product take back. We're thinking about how we uh, design for take back and so forth. And so this is bringing stakeholders upstream and downstream and integrating them into the business practices and business concept of the company. So product stewardship, you know, where you're building reputation and legitimacy already has been taking on added importance, I think will become even more important in the, in the wake of COVID. So this is all about life cycle thinking and stakeholder integration and so forth. But as I was saying before, um, these two kind of strategies around pollution prevention product stewardship, I think have already, you know, that th those have carried most companies when it comes to their approach to sustainability for the last 20 or 30 years. The upper part of this model, I think, is now what we'll see explode in, in the wake of COVID. That it, it's going to have increasingly to do with developing the sustainable competencies of the future. Uh, what are the clean and inclusive technologies of tomorrow? Uh, whether it's you know kind of renewability of energy, whether it's plant-based proteins, whether it's biomimicry or regenerative agriculture or three D printing or whatever it might be, these have been lurking there, laying around, being developed technologically. I think these are some of the ideas, as in Milton Friedman's language, that have been laying around that we will now see be put into place in a much more significant and concerted way in the wake of COVID-19 through radical innovation and new competency building. I think that, that we'll see this increasingly be the case. But in order for these technologies to be effectively deployed, we have to, we have to focus not just on building these technologies and skills, which is sort of an internal focus, but rather how can they be most linked, best linked out there to real needs in the world, right? So this has to do with opening up, co-creating new business models in order to serve the underserved in the world, to address the, you know, just the dramatic problems of inequality that we still face. So this has been the work on base of the pyramid that I've been involved with for a long time. And this is where the real growth, uh, entry, you know, growth path and trajectory opportunities lie uh, that was already true, but I think it will become increasingly true and laid bare and apparent by COVID-19. Right? <laughs> so th this will allow us to really focus in a much more concerted way when it comes to applying and deploying new in in inherently clean and environmentally sustainable technologies to those most in need you know, at the base of the income pyramid. And, and this is all about disruptive innovation, it's new partnerships, it's ecosystem building. And, and I think this will take on added significance uh, in, in the years to come. But I won't stop there because, you know, I think this is, this is sort of firm level, right? This has to do with how I think companies will need to, but will also be driven to change how they define value, right? That it's a much broader perspective where, you know, the, challenge, the societal challenges out there in the world uh, help companies frame strategies that actually deliver value for the long term because you have to you have to perform in all four quadrants if you're going to deliver long term value. I think that becomes increasingly important. But in order for that to be fully realized, we have to kind of rethink the objective function, and this has to do with changing the financial infrastructure, with reinventing finance, right? Because the edifice of finance over the last thirty or forty years. Not only, not only has it grown dramatically and become a much larger, perhaps some would say too large sector that ends up you know, being the tail wagging the dog, 
So, you know, in some ways we need to return finance to its true role, which is as a support function and enabler, right, the provider of capital. Uh, but I think it, it's also a matter of changing the logic, right, for what constitutes value uh, from the perspective of finance. So, so if we think about the logic of, you know, kind of the, the market fundamentalist financial capitalist logic, it, I think it looks something like this in the private, you know, kind of the primary capital market, you know, where real money is being invested. The logic, especially in ventures, right, those that, that, that have IPO potential has been sort of this fantasy land, you know, where increasingly entrepreneurs cook up these, these imaginative growth stories about how they're going to change the world, right, <laughs> through social mission. And they realize, you know, these in, incredible IPO uh, share prices only to then have the whole thing come crashing to the ground because they don't really have a viable business underneath it to start with. And, and this is real money being invested, right, in the, in, the, in the primary capital market. But then in the secondary, in the public market, we've had this obsessive focus on, you know, for managers to exceed quarterly earnings expectations, drive share price rewards in your executives holding options, and that this is the way to kind of focus the attention and deliver value for uh, the public market, right? The kind of the secondary public market, where we'll remember, we're not actually investing, you know, once a company goes public, there's no, th this is just secondary, this is trading of already existing, right? There's no new money being invested here. Uh, this is just trading, and I'll come back to that in a moment. So I think par part of what we will need to see, hopefully we'll see, is a change, you know, sort of a flip in the objective function of the, of the purpose of, of capital and finance that in a sustainable capitalist logic, the driving force for in the primary market would become, you know, shouldn't, shouldn't ventures, you know, sort of like, again, back to the future, shouldn't ventures seeking IPOs be held, first held accountable to demonstrate the viability of their business concept and produce realistic business plans, right? Rather than rather than kind of pie in the sky, pie, pie in the sky fantasy stories, you know, e even with platform technologies, right? Which is, um, uh, you know, unfortunately, the the way of the world when it comes to the primary market. Shouldn't shouldn't real money first have to demonstrate that you have a viable business concept, and that that becomes the primary logic for the primary market. And then when it comes to the secondary market. Shouldn't public companies be treated more like institutions, you know, like like they were a hundred years ago, or at least seventy years ago? You know, shouldn't they be treated as institutions to deliver and produce on a wider range of results for society, whether it's living wages or innovation, or environmental sustainability or community investment? Uh, remember, this these are public companies. This is this is the secondary market. This is the trading, essentially, just as a trading market, right? So there's no new money being invested. So the reality is, you know, the drivers of share price in the public market, what the, you know, what's defined as the driver of value is socially constructed, right? And, and for the last 30 or 40 years, that social construction has been defined by the logic of efficient markets, agency theory, and so forth, which has, you know, been perpetuated by business schools, by, you know, the teaching of finance, by, you know, the behavior of analysts and asset managers and so forth. But you know what? At root, this is there's a set of kind of consensual understandings and assumptions and agreements, right? That are, and it, and we have to realize that these are all social. These are all socially constructed. There's no there is no reason in theory why we couldn't decide that a different set of criteria should be the driver of value in the secondary market because it's a secondary market. <laughs> so 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 I think you know the traditional logic uh, pre-COVID even though there was a lot of struggle against it, was very much in the, uh, in the vein of, before you can change the world, first CEOs need to satisfy investors, right? And so this was the logic of, you know, activist investors and raiders and so forth and holding CEOs accountable to uh, short-term earnings. But I think, you know, the, the new logic, perhaps uh, we can hope increasingly becomes one driven by to satisfy investors and generate above market returns, CEOs need to demonstrate positive impact, right? And we're gonna hold CEOs accountable for the demonstration of positive impact. Rather than kind of imposing the almost impossible, uh, you know, kind of limitation or constraint when it comes to impact investing in its current form, that constraint is, 
all right, you know, we expect you to deliver, you know, competitive and above market returns. Uh, and, you know, then if it's possible for you to deliver on some things from a societal perspective, be it environment or social, great, you know, that, that, that'll be, that, that's added gravy. But, you know, you have to do that within the constraint of the traditional model of, of judging short-term returns and, and, the, and how stock price is driven. I think coming out of this, that, that, that our, our goal, our objective is, we wanna redefine the entire and transform the entire objective function of finance. And that then flips the whole system as I think about it. So this is very much what we're attempting to do with this new innovation, sustainable innovation MBA program at the University of Vermont that I've been involved in kind of starting up launching and standing up, you know, that think of it as the next capitalist reformation. Uh, you know, how can business and capitalism uh, be redesigned to include, serve, and lift the underserved and simultaneously conserve and replenish natural capital that supports all life on earth and make money while doing it, right? I mean, no one would deny that you have to make money and be profitable in, in order to be a successful company, but we should return, you know, the discipline of profitability to its rightful place, which is one of the goals and a means to an end right, that the end of the company ought to be actually serving and solving problems in the world, and profitability is a vehicle for achieving that. So I'll close then, you know, with a, a couple of questions and, a, and then a, a thought and an observation, you know, so the questions are, is the COVID crisis the next great disruption? Will it prove to be the crisis that usher, ushers in a new age of sustainable capitalism? Uh, some questions, does the coronavirus signal the end of market fundamentalism and shareholder price? I mean, certainly markets are crashed, although, you know, creeping back in the U.S., but I think this is kind of a signal event, and uh, it could well spell the end, right? It could be a punctuated equilibrium point. Will sustainability and inclusion become the focal points for business in a, in a post-COVID world? So what are the new capabilities and practices that will be necessary for firms to flourish in the future? What new important research questions does this crisis generate? And I think there are many. And how must, how must business education change to remain relevant in the future? Because I think this has significant implications for business schools and business education. We're going to see a lot of business schools and MBA programs just simply disappear, right, in, in, over the next year plus. Uh, and I think those that remain are going to be challenged to rethink the way they approach the role of business in the world. So then just to close, uh, you know, in 1665, uh, Isaac Newton was a student, right, at the University of Cambridge when another wave of the bubonic plague hit. <laughs> and uh, it, it was severe enough to force the closure of most businesses and the university which sent him home, right? He happened to be from a wealthy family, so he was able to go back to a country estate. And during that year plus that he was in quarantine, uh, this was the time that he actually conceptualized calculus and the theory of gravity. <laughs> so, you know, uh, this is known as the uh, Annus Mirabilis and uh, the wonderful year, right? That, that, and, and so I think the question for all of us is that can we take this crisis and make it into another wonderful year. Can 2020 be the wonderful year for a new age, the launch of a new age of sustainable capitalism? So let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, too, for such an insightful uh, presentation. Sorry, uh, do you have comments? Yeah, I, uh, thank you very much. Um, first, I mean, this is the great, uh, um, uh, it's, 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 it's uh, uh, from the shifts of, uh, you know, ideologies are needed uh, for all of this to be implemented. The question is how? Uh, can this be uh, implemented in a country like, for example, where we have big social problems and 
Uh, Your voice is cutting out a little bit. And now you're gone. <laughs> Hello? Yes, now I can hear you. Yeah, sorry. Um, so, um, I mean, I mean, uh, this requires a lot of uh, uh, fundamental shifts of ideologies. And um, uh, uh, um, my question is how to, imp to apply, how to make this shift. Uh, how to implement this uh, th this shift uh, in in terms of uh, practical implementation uh, in general and number and and in specific for a country like Egypt where we have all these big you know uh, social problems that hopefully can be transformed into uh, uh, you know a, a better uh, lifestyle like for example we have a major chronic problem of uh, rec uh, garbage recycling. That's, uh, that's, that's, that's really a major issue that we are having. Affordable housing is another social pro problem that we are having that for some reason, it, the, 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 the market is not able to, uh, to, uh, to solve these issues on, on its own. So uh, even with government support, I mean, affordable housing, even with government support, it's, it's not really doing uh, all the best that it can. Uh, same thing for garbage recycling. Same thing for for other for other uh, uh, major social issues. So my question is, how to transfer social value or social problems into an added capital value, and how can you how how can we transfer this uh, kind of like fundamental transfer that, that, you're, you're, that is uh, needed? But my question is, how to do it? Right, that, and that's of course the you know the multi-trillion-dollar question. <laughs> So, it, so I think there are multiple leverage points, right? When it when it comes to, I mean, that the way you've articulated really does sort of capture the, the challenge and the complexity we have, right? There, uh, and you know, I guess I'd start by saying, there are probably there are probably not probably there are definitely some societal challenges and problems that the market can simply never solve, right? No, you know the, so the the. We start with the premise that the, the problem isn't the market, the problem is an unconstrained market, right? So that part of what we're thinking about is how do we sort of refocus and constrain markets such that they, they produce better results societally. And I think if we think in this, in this way of sustainable capitalism, then the market actually can deliver much more, you know, in terms of societal returns, socially and environmentally than it has been, right? If we sort of redefine how we how we uh, define value and and i think one a key leverage point there and this has sort of been my life's work is is transforming business education because you know again I, I go back to what i said earlier i i watched business schools just completely change you know between 1985 and the early 90s they were different places uh there were still plenty of faculty around in the in the mid 1980s who really thought business was, you know, was an institution that it served important societal functions, and much of that was gone, you know, by by the early '90s, swept away by, you know, the the idea of the market for corporate control and shareholder primacy. That that became kind of the business school ideology, as, as you, and that's a good term for it. So I think part of it, and and then those people, you know, decades of graduates from business schools become the leaders in the financial sector and in corporations, and they have these this ideology embedded in their head, and that then becomes the reality of the world. So I I think part of it is business education ha has to be fundamentally reinvented and transformed, uh, in order to in order to, for a new generation of leaders to come to the world with a very different thought process. We already see that happening, right? I mean, the, that, that's happening by hook or by crook, but I think the transformation of business education writ large can have a transformational effect. That's our attempt with the Sustainable Innovation MBA program for sure. But then I think part, part, of, part of the sustainable capitalist idea is also a, a, for companies to realize that, and again, I think this, this is already happening, but will become much more important, that one collaborate they can't just all do it alone right it's not just a bunch of companies creating their own competitive models that there's going to be there's going to have to be much more collaboration much more banding together of companies and working with uh 
ecosystem partnership ecosystems that include NGOs and uh, uh, that there, there'll be much more need for collective action within which there are individual companies embedded in order to get after some of these problems. We already see that kind of pattern taking shape, you know, in, in the form of efforts to, uh, to deal with things like sustainable palm oil, you know, and, and uh, uh, sustainable textiles and sustainable fisheries and so forth. You, al already you see those sort of collective action collaborations occurring. I think that'll become increasingly important. Uh, and then I think companies will have to get, be, will have to kind of get off their high horse, you know, and lo lobbying, you know, is still kind of a dirty word, I think, you know, it's still, the idea of lobbying still connotes that companies are active in public policy, but it's primarily just to kind of maintain the status quo and protect their preferred position in the current market structure. Whereas I think, you know, the role the corporations play in public policy in the, in the, as we look forward, will have to become, and they'll be judged increasingly on the extent to which they become a participant in the policy process to create new, more forward-leaning policies that address the kinds of problems that you're describing, right? That, so rather than just looking to protect current positions, it's about companies getting active in the public policy process to create the policies of tomorrow that are forward-leaning. And that's the upper part of the two-by-two two matrix, right? And, and I think increasingly, companies will be judged on that, right? right? You know, like in the past, lobbying was sort of done in a dark room, and sometimes companies got called out for it. But increasingly, that'll be in the sunlight, and, uh, and companies' behavior on that front will be, will, yeah. will be better known. Okay. So, you know, sort of positive forward-leaning engagement in the policy process and sort of pushing government to do its job, right? I mean, I think the truth is that all around the world, the U.S., my country included, government, I mean, the reason that we have so much movement over the last 30 years in this area of sustainable and inclusive business is because, at least in part, government hasn't done its job, right? I mean, they, they just simply abdicated their role when it comes to some basic services and functions. So you see the private sector trying to step in and provide clean water, provide access to energy, provide affordable housing, provide health care, right, through innovative new business models to serve the base of the income pyramid. And, and that's important, and we want to see that continue. But at root, you know, go government needs to step up, right? I mean, <laughs> in some cases, those really are core functions of government. And increasingly, companies have to be willing to get out there and lobby for that as well. Oh, great, thank you very much. Uh, we have 15 minutes remaining, and I'm sure there are a lot of questions. Uh, by the way, you can just write your questions. You don't have to raise your hand, by the way. You can just write the questions to Karimann just on the chat box, because some people are raising their hands. Uh, you can just write the questions in the chat box to Karimann, and, um, and uh, she will be uh, asking the questions. So Karimann, uh, you have questions? Okay, uh, let's do uh, like two rounds of questions. I will give you a couple of questions, and then I'll give you the chance to uh, answer them, and then uh, we'll ask you other couple of questions. Okay. The 2008 crash led, uh, did not actually lead to a restructured cha change. People dusted themselves off and carried on using the same models and ways of doing business. How do we as a society invoke social value in all business models? That's the first question. The second question. So if I could uh, just quickly comment on that one. So in, in some ways, I think that, that, that the response I just gave, you know, is, is my best attempt to, to identify a leverage point for the, for, the, for the transformations that I'm describing and that we sorely need. That, you know, that there are leverage, there, that the business education, this is education, I think, has to be fundamentally transformed, and we have some ability to do that because business schools will be unusually vulnerable, right, over the next few years. So I think it is one of those punctuate points of punctuated equilibrium where business education really is as a point where it's at one of those points where it can be transformed, and we have to make sure we seize that opportunity. Uh, I think financial markets are also, you know, in an unusually vulnerable position right now. So there is some opportunity to really see significant change, and that's driven by, by increasingly by investors themselves. I mean, again, you see that with how much more money 
is being, you know, you have in, e even institutional investors, right, are realizing that they have to pay much more attention to impact investing than they have in the past because their individual retirees and so forth are demanding it, right? They're absolutely, so, I, so you know, I think the, the other leverage point is, is, you know, sort of a change of the public mind, right? And I think we see that, and, that's be, and that will be exercised in the form of the demands on institutional investors and asset managers to behave differently, right, when it comes to this. So I think that that's another leverage point when it, when it comes to the financial infrastructure. And then the last is companies just simply need to, dis, you know, the idea of, of the sustainable value matrix versus just quarterly earnings short-termism is, you know, I think, cru crucially important. We have to redefine what it means to create value. Okay, thank you so much. Two other questions related to uh, education. Um, one of the audience is saying that, yes, we agree that education is a game changer, but it needs to be embedded in primary education, not start embedding it in business education. We need new generation of young people who know how to create uh, business cases that solve social issues. Uh, when it's too late, if you empower uh, young people early uh, to be uh, problem solvers and social activists in their own communities, it could be a game changer. Do you agree with this? Yeah, 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 I, I, I do. I do, but you know, ha ha having said that, uh, I'll, I'll speak now in terms of what I, what I perceive in the US. Uh, I'm sure it's different in, in Egypt and in other parts of the world, but maybe not as much as we might think. What, what I see in the US is, I mean, our, our primary and secondary public education system is failing, right? So we're struggling mightily when it comes to that. We're producing, you know, it, it's, it's very unequal, right? But having said that, uh, the, the actual pedagogy, you know, in other words, the content of what the students learn in many cases, they, their students graduate from high school having learned a lot about you know, the natural environment and about uh, societal challenges and societal problems. And, and, and in some cases, they, you know, they, they've already been sort of groomed to think you know, businesses are the, are the evil empire and the problem. You know, that, in other words, they don't necessarily come with a preconceived idea that they just, they, they wanna be you know, vulture capitalists and make as much money as they can, that actually tends to get beaten into them when they get into college and business school. <laughs> so, uh, so, so I think that, that, that students, you know, graduating at the age of 17 or 18, in many cases, right, ha are already predisposed to think in the ways that we're describing. And, and it's at that point that they get steered in a very different direction. So, you know, and especially undergraduate business majors, right, can be just absolutely brainwashed. Uh, <laughs> so, so I think it's the, especially the, the higher education piece and community college piece is really, really important when it comes to this. You know, those people that tilt toward be, having an interest in business, that business education really be transformed in a fundamental way. Uh, in your opinion, what's the ideal role that civil society can play in order uh, to push for a sustainable capitalism? I, I mean, I think civil society has been carrying a heavy burden and, you know, has been doing everything that it could possibly do for the last 30 plus years. I mean, it's, it's really been civil society that has been the motive force, right? That I, I think civil society, you know, if we think of the three primary uh, leverage points, sort of action levers in the world. It's government, it's civil society, and it's business, right? Those are really sort of the three organized forms for taking action in the world. Uh, government, I think, for the last 30 plus years has been in retreat and has abdicated, right? I mean, that, and that part of that has been the, the, the market fundamentalist, you know, uh, shareholder primacy ideology that, you know, that, that government is the problem we need, you know, we should drown government in a, in a bathtub, right? That was the term used here in the U.S., you know, back in the 80s. So, you know, I think government has been in retreat. I think that will change. That has to change. You know, we will see a resurgence in the importance of government coming out of COVID. 
because if, frankly, if it doesn't happen, I don't know how we're going to come out of COVID. <laughs> so, uh, but then I think business, you know, has, we've, we've seen at least some efforts by some in the business world to think differently when it comes to business and society. But I would say the dominant perspective in business for the last 30 or 40 years has remained market fundamentalist. So, you know, government has been absent by and large or in retreat. Business has been incremental and it's been civil society that's been all in uh, is the way I look at it. Civil society has been the driver for the last 30 or 40 years. So I think looking forward, it's high time that government and business step up to the plate so that civil society can become just the partner that they deserve to be rather than carrying the heavy burden by themselves. Thank you. What is the approach that the University of Vermont adopt uh, to teach their MBA students sustainability? Yeah, so I, I would encourage anyone interested in our program, you know, not to be an advertisement, but just Google Sustainable Innovation MBA University of Vermont and our program will pop up. And on our website, you can, the, the entire curriculum is there. Uh, you can look through it, but in a nutshell, what we did seven years ago with, you know, a dean who, you know, is a true leader and, and had, had this vision, a guy named Sanjay Sharma, uh, was actually just abolish the existing MBA program, right? So <laughs> we had the rare opportunity of starting from scratch with a clean sheet of paper because the dean was able to abolish the MBA program that existed. It, it was not going very well. You know, he was a new dean, so he was able to come in shut it down because it was losing money. So he didn't get a lot of resistance, got some, but not a lot. And that then opened the door for us, you know, as, and, and that's when I joined, right? I, kinda, I got involved with, with the uh, business school at that point at Vermont. That opened the door to starting over again, right? So we had the, that rare opportunity as a disruptive innovator in, in business education world to start with a clean sheet of, of paper and develop a completely new curriculum from scratch, where you know from start to finish, the perspective of entrepreneurship and, and business innovation for social inclusion and environmental sustainability is, is the driving force in every course from start to finish. You know, it's, it's, it's no longer the model where I, you know, because I was at Michigan for a long time and started a program there. I was at UN University of North Carolina, I was at Cornell, started centers for sustainable business and base of the pyramid business and all those places. Uh, but all of those were, you know, the, the metaphor we've used is saddlebag sustainability programs in the sense that they just hang off the side of the existing horse and the horse doesn't change. And you can always just take the saddle off the horse and it's the same old horse. And the horse is the core curriculum, right? So most business schools still have a first in a two year MBA program a conventional core curriculum, which is dominated by the shareholder primacy way of thinking. Uh, still, right? It's not that different than it was in the late 80s. I, you know, I started teaching strategy at Michigan in 1986 and uh, the strategy core course. And I can tell you that, it, you know, it, yeah, there's new cases and there's new readings, but philosophically and ideologically, it's not that different now than it was then. So the problem with exist with the existing MBA programs is that the, the, the issue of sustainability and uh, poverty and social inclusion get treated as elective courses in the second year, right? They just kind of hang off the side. And, and by then, you know, sort of, you know, I'll use the, the, the damage is already done. <laughs> you know, by, by, by then, students, you know, kind of mindset has already been set in most cases. And, and, and actually, a colleague of mine at the University of Michigan, a guy named Jerry Davis, and a doctoral student of his has collected data on this to show that in conventional, you know, sort of top 20 MBA programs in the U.S. like Michigan and Kellogg and a few others where they've collected data, the attitudes of incoming business students shift in fundamental ways from, because, because they asked them, they've collected data, you know, longitudinally. When the student first starts in an MBA program, what are their aspirations? What do they see themselves doing in the world? And most say they want to use business to change the world for the better and so forth. That's their motivation. They want to work for, with purpose. Uh, but then that gradually changes as they interview 
them after the first semester of the core, the second semester of the core, you know, before and after their summer internship, and then, then as they start the second year, and then ultimately when they get job placed. By the time they get job placed, it's really about, uh, you know, I'm competitive with my peers, and I need to get a job, you know, that, that carries with it, you know, it shows that I've really achieved, and I need to make a lot of money, you know, in, in order to pay back all this debt <laughs> that I've accumulated getting my MBA. And so J Jerry and his, and his doctoral student have the data on that. It's very clear that that's what happens. So for us with our MBA program, we just completely threw that out the window, right? So from start to finish, our MBA program focuses on the knowledge skills, tools, capabilities, perspectives, and mindsets that leaders of the future are going to need to create tomorrow's socially inclusive and environmentally sustainable business. And the students come to our MBA program because that's what they want to do. And that, that, that's unchanging from start to finish. We're a purpose-driven MBA program. Right, uh, that you froze. <laughs> are with us? Something froze. Um, I just had a comment on the education question. Actually, uh, it's uh, interesting because uh, in Egypt we had in, uh, uh, now it's uh, online education, even in schooling, not even universities in schooling, even third grade or fourth grade, they're letting them do community projects, and that's yes. something. Yeah, that's something, even in third grade, and that's something I think has never been done in, in the past. You know, it's, uh, you know, our schooling tends to be a little bit rigid in terms of, you know, you know, sciences and so forth. So this shift was kind of uh, sudden and massive. And uh, I hope that this shift will continue after, after the COVID is over and we don't go back to our old norms, you know. So that's something that uh, could be a positive thing that we can uh, Absolutely. Uh, move on because with. Because I think the, the field-based kind of practicum way of learning is crucial. So that's a big part of our Sustainable Innovation MBA. We're a one-year MBA program. All the coursework is done in nine months. And then the last three and a half months are a full-time in-venture, in-company, in-field practicum project. Mm -hmm. in, a, in a company or an NGO where they're, you know, and we're pretty careful when, when it comes to vetting projects. So all of the practicum projects have to relate to harnessing business to, you know, for innovation in in the social and environmental space. You know, that, that's what all of our practicums have to do with. So the students are able to then, it's like the capstone experience in the program. And it's really, really crucially important. Uh, okay, uh, can we take one uh, final question? Sure. Before we go? Okay. Okay, the whole system is rigid uh, to be biased towards wealth and power. This includes taxation, access to finance, access to government support. To change this would require more than changing the value definition of the firm or the MBA education. A new ecosystem would require new governance. Would we reach this linear fashion? Uh, or do you think we need uh, a nonlinear uh, change? <laughs> really important question right I mean uh, so so I come back to you know the, the earlier point which is in in my view government has been missing in action uh, or I shouldn't say that government in many cases has actually been a negative force right it, in that it has you know it suffers from and I say government writ large you know government around the world <laughs> right that, that and, and that's true in the US and it's true uh, that it's riddled with cronyism, riddled with, you know, preferential treatment, you know, riddled with money being directed to those that are already in power and that need it the least. Uh, and I, the, o the only way that can change is for citizens, organizations, and companies to demand that it changes. I don't know any other way, right? I mean. <laughs> Thank you so much, Stu. That's well, it's fantastic. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you all. And um, um, do you want to announce our next uh, webinar uh, topic? Uh... Yes, it's, 
it's about uh, the age of philanthropy, beyond, the new philanthropy beyond charity by the vice president of the Ford Foundation, Ellery Hank. Thank you, Stuart. My pleasure. Thanks to you guys. Good to see you all again. Thank you, Stuart. Very, very insightful. Thank you. Thanks, Ali.